Last time we covered the Type 38 long rifle. While a beautiful and wonderful design, at 50 inches it was just too long for cavalry and other special troops. So a carbine would obviously follow. Hi. I'm Othias, and this, oh good lord, it's very light, this is the Japanese Type 38 carbine, uh, another one of those pseudo Arisakas. Let's get it over to the light box. Weighing in at 7 and 3 quarters pounds and an overall length of 38 inches, this is a handy little gun. And it shoots that wonderful mild 6.5 by 50 millimeter cartridge, making her very pleasant. Now, just as a reminder, that is five rounds out of a stripper clip into a staggered fixed magazine. Now, this episode is part two of two, but if you reach back far enough for our Type 30 that wasn't all that long ago, it maybe is considered part three. I highly recommend watching the Type 30 episode and the Type 38 episode. It's going to really help piece this together. All right. Uh, anyway, this time we're going to talk about the 38 carbines. Uh, there's two that are really worth mentioning today that we have examples of, and then there's some other models and extra little bits that we're going to fill out for the overall 38. Uh, while we're at it, though, I need to rewind just a bit and mention the Type 30 carbine, which, as we said, was introduced for cavalry and specialty troops, and even though it wasn't originally planned to have a bayonet lug, it ended up being fitted with one. Well, when the 38 was released, they basically took the same overall profile and pattern, and worked it into this little guy. Um, same thing, 38 action. And so when we go to look at these features, know that you could find most of these on either a 30 or a 38 carbine. And the only difference is going to be the actual action, which we've talked about in two separate episodes. Now, I'm sorry I don't necessarily have the rarest carbines on the world stacked up to go in that minor detail. But hey, you're going to get a good overview from us. All right, let's take a closer look and see what all was changed on this little gun other than just being shorter. First things first, you may, if you're eagle-eyed, have noticed that this is a post-World War I Type 38 carbine. Uh, there'd be some minor differences, but it's really not critical to what we're talking about today. Uh, instead, let's just draw our attention to the overall length, the very light weight. We still got our same two-piece stock, although now we have side sling and side sling. This is so that you can carry it up on your back more conveniently. Uh, this is a gun that's really built around the idea that the primary thing you're doing on the battlefield is not firing the rifle. It's nice to have the rifle, you want the rifle, but you're doing a lot of riding or uh, managing of artillery or transport or something. You're just This is a gun that's meant to stay out of the way more often than not. Uh, other changes include the shorter ranged 2000 meter rear sight, and up at the front, this comes over from the Type 30 as well, we have a sight protector on the front sight. This would actually be later adopted on later production Type 38 long rifles, and we'll see it on the Type 99. It's just a good all-around idea. Uh, we have a sort of full-length handguard up to the front muzzle band. Uh, that makes it nice and convenient to grab even when she's hot and on the move. Uh, and otherwise, really, we're not we're not varying much from our long rifle. So if you're more curious about other features of this gun, again, check out our nice long rifle episode. All right, well, I hate to disappoint people with something so short, but there's nothing radically different about the Type 38 carbine from the long rifle, other than, again, length and weight. Uh, so, with that in mind, let's just go ahead and kick this one over to May and let her test fire it before we move on to the next model. Oh, and by the way, no animations this one. We did the Type 38 action last time. Well, I hate, you know, I say this all the time. You're gonna have to go back and check that previous episode. Sorry guys, they all build on each other. Yeah, carbine time. Line up my sights, and... Tiny rifle, bigger kick. Oh, 
target check time. Not a bad grouping. Okay, Othias, your turn. You know, that looked positively pleasant. I cannot say enough, and I know I've said it several times already in this short period of the episode, this thing's great. It's terrifically handy. It's beautifully balanced. I actually, you know, I said the Type 38's my favorite rifle for World War I. I think very specifically the Type 38 carbine is my favorite rifle of World War I. But we'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Now, these guns were manufactured by the same arsenals as the other Type 38 long rifle, which means that only one arsenal would produce for World War I, the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. But we'll go ahead and mention the others in the total production figure so that you guys can check your markings. Tokyo would crank out roughly 225,000 of these guys. Kokura would do nearly 50,000. Nagoya would close in just past 200,000. And Hoten would clear 52,000. Now, as handy as these little darlings are, they were not apparently perfect for cavalry. Uh, recall, twice now I've said that the initial Type 30 carbines were not going to be issued with a bayonet log. This was a later addition for other troops. And the reason for that was is that large Type 30 bayonet is fairly awkward if you're already carrying a sword. Notably, the Type 32 Cavalry Saber. Now, uh, the... Cavalry initially thought this was sword was going to be fine. That's all they'd need. Why would you need uh, a little 15 three quarter inch bayonet when you had this massive sword? But the problem is, and especially this was learned during that Russo-Japanese war, if you're with a band of buddies and you're shoulder to shoulder and you want to charge a position and poke, uh, you don't want to swing a big sword side to side. You might poke your buddy. You want to poke the other guy. All right, so uh, they realized maybe we do want a bayonet but we can't just slap it on it's going to clatter against our sword it's going to you know bust up both scabbards it's going to be awkward to move around we're already not the tallest guys on the block and these things are big and cumbersome and heavy and we don't need to be carrying everything on our belt like we're starting to have a grass skirt made out of just junk so we need a solution for having a bayonet but not necessarily wearing it on our hip or anywhere else on our body. The only other place to keep it is permanently attached to the rifle. And so they take a page from the Italians in that Kakarno cavalry model, and they'd work up this little guy is the Japanese Type 44, again, arguably an Arisaka. With an overall length of 38 and one quarter inch, a quarter inch longer than that 38 carbine, and weighing in at 8.7 pounds, a pound heavier, this stout little guy was meant specifically for cavalry. He still chambered the 6.5 by 50 millimeter cartridge, five stripper clip, staggered fixed magazine. These improvements to the Type 38 carbine would be approved in 1911, making this the Meiji era Type 44. Uh, that means that we get a new crest, new markings. Now, it's hard to see all the improvements to this gun from way back there. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at what makes up this little carbine. First things first, you guys might notice there's no dust cover on this one. It's supposed to have one. This one just didn't have one because it was brought back by most likely an American who didn't care for dust covers because the Japanese sure as crap left them on there. All right, uh, just pretend there's a dust cover. You guys will be all right without it, I promise. Mostly from the rear, we're looking at the same gun as the Type 38 carbine. One little difference we'll get to in a moment back here. We still have a two-piece stock. We still have the Type 38 action. We still have a shorter range carbine sight. Uh, we still have, with all this stuff, a front sight protector. Ignore the rest for a moment. And then if we flip her over, we're still side slung and side slung. Although, there's one key difference here. That angle is very specific to cavalry troops to make it a little easier on them. You might not have noticed it on the earlier 38. So let me bring that back up. There we go much more squared up angle. All right, so let me get out good old patented plastic pokey hand so that we can make our way through the rest. Uh, turning your attention to the front, there is a lot going on here. One, we have this massive housing that is attached with not one, but two cross screws. Uh, we have a front 
log that is frankly massive for when this bayonet flips around. And uh, otherwise, it's just sort of titanic. I mean, this thing is super reinforced. So if we flip her over, I can show you this very big, very obvious, very easy to use button. If we depress that and pull on this bayonet, uh, this whole 15 and 3 quarter inch length blade is going to go right past my chin and nose. And it's going to come forward and on that very large lug that I pointed out before, it's going to lock down. That is firm. This is way beyond the Kakarno. Uh, very stiff. Uh, the blade itself is extremely strong as well. It's pointed straight out, unlike the angle of the Kakarno. And uh, if you can't tell, I'll give it some tilt. We've got sort of a cruciform. It's more of a wedge shape. We've got a flat top. We've got a sort of pointed bottom edge. So it's like half a cruciform. And uh, unsharp. No, no blade to it, guys. Perfectly safe in that regard. Not very sharp at the tip either. This is for good old rough poking and horrible, horrible trauma. Oh, also, uh, set down into the top, we have a fuller. That's going to add some rigidity and strength and lighten the load a bit. Beautiful design. Uh, again, I, I can't reiterate this enough. This is meant, especially with this oversized housing, for repeated, repeated stabbings of many, many enemies of the Empire. The Japanese really like their bayonets. All right, uh, let me fold this guy up, and we'll talk about this quillion for a moment. See how we've added another one here? Well, this is just like the one you'd find on the Type 30 bayonets, which we are now no longer fitting. We had to fit it directly to the rifle so that we could still stack arms, you know, your rifle TP, and also because the Japanese really did care about sort of rifle fencing, if you want to call it that. They thought bayonet to bayonet, they wanted to have a catch. Um, this is often quoted as a sword breaker. It's not, realistically, what it's there for is A, sort of like a handguard to stop it from sliding all the way down the action, but B, there, it's a catch. It's not a breaker. Um, in other words, if you have an opposing blade coming in and it gets into the loop it, with a simple twist, of this gun, and it's not even like we have to twist it with a wrist, you just sort of drop the gun in a rotary motion. It's, Aikido has a lot of these movements in it, it's left over from old Japanese judo and things like that. But the idea is that there's a very natural motion that we can go through that's going to create a twist in there, and that's going to bind and pull on the other blade. It's going to pull it away from your vital organs, and it's going to maybe pull it out of the other guy's hand if he's not really expecting it. Uh, but again, not a sword breaker. All right, now, if you notice, we've got all this going on where the bayonet sets up under the gun. We have a channel. Let me get that pokey hand back. Uh, we have a channel to fit that blade. We have a special barrel band for it. Uh, we have all this flat space up here for the blade. There's nowhere for cleaning rod. So that would have to be moved. And it was placed all the way back at the butt. Um, there's a little hole. Sorry guys, gotta line up with that camera. There's a hole here, and it's controlled by this little lever here. So uh, we give this guy a push, and believe me, he's a thumbnail breaker. He's turned down, hole is open. So we'll have multi-piece cleaning rod set that we can take out of there, share it with our buddies, that sort of thing. Um, real easy, real compact, simple little hole in the buttstock. Doesn't really reduce the strength very much at all. All right, now that I've shown you all my hole, I think it's time to hand this over to May and see how she does on the range with it. All right, 44 time. Take aim, and... Slow her down, Othias. All right, how'd I do? A little high, but really tight. 
Othias, you're good to go. See guys, no animation, but double the May. That works out pretty well for everybody, I think. All right, so uh, as you can tell, this is a serviceable little carbine, and the Japanese thought so too. It would stay in use until the end of World War II, so that's a good run. It might have lasted longer, but the U.S. kind of shut them down. Anyway, uh, these guys were in production as long as the Type 38s and manufactured by the same factories, so let's just quickly run through those numbers. Now, there would only be three arsenals. Good old Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. Kokura afterwards, and Nagoya. Tokyo Artillery Arsenal would produce roughly 57,000, Kokura would crank out roughly 22,000, and Nagoya would crank out roughly 13,000. As you can tell from these figures, the Type 44 is somewhat uncommon compared to the long rifle and standard carbine. The Type 44 didn't see a lot of changes except up here on this actual housing. Uh, initial production for quite a number of years would be just the same as you see here with the same two screw pattern in this configuration, but uh, this unfortunately is sort of clamping on that barrel a bit. It's creating some unusual vibration. It's throwing off the accuracy on this gun just a bit, and the Japanese thought that they could do better. So starting in the 1930s, you're going to see two more variations on this setup at the front of the carbine. Here is our version, like the one I have today. Later, the screws would be spread out and the whole assembly lengthened. Internally, the barrel was now essentially free-floated. Still later, the housing was again extended slightly and the second screw placed further out. So improvements to that bayonet assembly, well, they did reduce the accuracy problems. And coincidentally, they also solved a number of issues with the wood cracking up here at the front, really strengthening up the whole front end, really making it good for stabbing people. This thing's really good for stabbing people. The Japanese really like stabbing people. All right, anyway, um, with that much resolve, you think that this would be really the de facto only cavalry uh, gun in Japanese inventory. But there's a little known and very minorly produced Japanese cavalry rifle. These are Type 38 long rifles with the barrels shortened from 31 and quarter inches down to 25. That makes it fit a standard short rifle pattern. All appear to have been made at Nagoya, so well after World War I and our focus today. With a very, very rough estimate of 100,000 produced, it's a rare variant. Also, there's no known record of an entire unit being armed with these, so the name Cavalry Rifle, eh, that's been handed down from researchers. I'm not even sure the original source. There's not a lot we know about this gun. While we're getting into oddities, I'll also briefly mention the Type 1 folding carbine. This was developed in 1941 for paratroopers, so it's way off the mark for us today. It's argued that its crude nature gives away the fact that it was meant for training only, and we never really saw action. But we're not really sure what was going on with these guys either, because, again, records destroyed post-war, and we're just not a lot of them to observe. Finally, returning to World War I, sort of, I'll mention the Mexican Arisaka. These were known as the Model 1913. They were ordered by General Victoriano Huerta after he seized power. Mostly just like the regular old Type 38 long rifles and carbines, but chambered in 7mm and taking Mexico's own Mauser bayonet. Also, they had this really sweet crest. Despite paying a hefty deposit on his order, the Japanese were still a little concerned about Huerta's precarious government position. So they sort of held back on the order a bit, and boy were they right because he was deposed pretty quickly, which left them still sitting on 60,000 unsold rifles. Luckily, Russia would buy those. Russia would buy anything. Russia really liked Arisaka's, they were probably the second or third most common rifle in that country, and yet we never talk about it. All right, uh, I promised you guys uh, I'd talk a little bit more about Japanese Arisaka markings, or rather Japanese Type 38 markings, because these aren't technically Arisaka's guys. Uh, not that it's going to change anything for the next hundred years. But um, let's go ahead and get into an explanation of the serial numbers and the prefixes, because I know some of you already know about it, but others might not. Initial production by Tokyo would range up to over 2 million in the serial numbers. 
Now, these were hand applied one numeral at a time, and this became a bit of a bother. So when production switched over to Nagoya, within about the first 5,000 made, they realized they needed a new system. These guns were produced in 100,000 unit batches. Basically, they'd run through 100,000 rifles with regular serial numbers, and then they'd roll over. So starting back at one, two, up to another 100,000. Well, every time they did that, they would go ahead and put a prefix at the beginning. That prefix was marked in a character known as katakana, which is a phonetic alphabet in Japan. And that phonetic alphabet is based on an alphabetical order from a poem known as Iroha. Now, Iroha was a poem from the later Heian period, and it's what we know as a pangram, which means it contains every uh, letter of an alphabet exactly once, which is perfect because that becomes a pattern for you to sort of organize your alphabet if you had no previous reason to put it in order. Now, ideally, you would expect this to work as follows. We produce 100,000 rifles and then switch to E prefix. Then we produce 100,000 more and switch to Ro prefix, and then Ha prefix, and so on. The problem is uh, we have multiple manufacturers, and we have earlier production to estimate as well, and we have multiple types of rifle and carbine. So what ends up happening is that there are blocks of letters assigned to serve as prefixes for different manufacturers over different time spans. So that means that you cannot just look at your prefix and your serial number and know that this is the whatever -th number gun produced. Additionally, manufacturers like Hoten would come up with their own odd rules at times to just sort of mess with you along the way. Now, I know a lot of you Type 38 owners out there want me to break down all these markings by date on this video. That is not happening, uh, especially with the Type 38 compared to the Type 99. It's a little murky, so you're gonna wanna get all your markings together and go talk to some guys on gun boards and especially go see if you can find a copy of that wonderful bonsai book that we have linked in the description. That's really the way to know more about your rifle. That book and those guys go well beyond anything in this video. This is cursory. All right, so uh, Type 38 serves well in carbine form and long rifle form. The only big thing you're gonna notice if you own one of these things not everybody, but some of you will notice that you are getting bulged cases on your spent ammunition. Now, that is a function of the fact that they found early on that they were having problems with extraction on some of the ammo. So they went ahead and started a reaming process. I find this very curious because uh, while it does bulge them, it doesn't seem to create gas leaks very often. And even if it did, the system's perfect at handling them. It's no real risk to you. I would stuff 50 BMG into one of these things if I could. I trust these rifles implicitly. But it's interesting to me because we have a sort of secondary lug that hits the bolt stop instead of the actual locking lug. And we have an early switch to a ream chamber, all to avoid sticking in the chamber. Honestly, those are two things that we should have seen on the Ross rifle way sooner. And the Japanese are on it, uh, well ahead of the game. So these are brilliant little guns that are well wrapped up and maintained. Anyway, uh, now I shouldn't say that they're perfect because as we've said once before in this whole tumultuous series, 6.5 was disappointing. It was disappointing in Russia and it would be disappointing again in China because of the dense foliage and men behind obstacles and things like that. And also because of its wound characteristics. It just wasn't knocking men down like they wanted. And so, uh, eventually the Japanese would switch over to 7.7 and release the new and improved Type 99 long and short rifles, and then later the short rifle. Whole other episode, guys. Absolutely fascinating, but well away from World War I. Despite the official adoption of the Type 99, there were plenty of Type 38s still in the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy through the end of World War II. The U.S. would run across plenty of these guys. The Chinese certainly did not care for these, even though they would use tons of them, especially after they were surrendered by the Japanese at the end of the war, they would roll right into the Chinese Civil War. These guns have lengthy and extensive service lives. You're talking about from 1906 until 1945 with the Japanese, and then many years beyond with the Chinese and other small Asian powers. I'll talk more about that when we get to the 99, when we get away from World War I. All right, so with all of that extensive service history wrapped up, with all these derivations wrapped up, and with a lot of love for these guns, Let's turn this over to May and get her opinion very specifically 
on the carbines. There's something comforting about a routine, and so I'm going to vaguely insult May. You're a butt. All right, so let's go ahead and get her opinion on this handy little carbine. Here you go. GB mode, activate, go! Okay, so for real, seriously. Starting out with the ergonomics of this gun, please, please, please go back and watch the Type 38 episode because from here down, it's pretty much a Type 38. There's not much difference in terms of all the features on this gun. It's got shorter sights, yes, when they're flipped up, but to be honest, I wasn't really using them in that sense. I didn't flip down. It's got a shorter sight radius, but that's about it. Um, the action itself is different. The trigger, there's still clean. Um, no real difference there. Still got the thin wrist. However, one big difference is T-Tiny. Look at this. It's so short. I can do whatever I want with it. I can shoot anywhere so quickly and easily. Like, this is hilarious. I love this. This has, like, all the best features about the Type 38, plus more, shorter and easier to carry. I could carry this on the battlefield all day long. One point of clarification there, because I think I heard a word missing. The action is not different. It's the same as the Type 38 action. That's what you meant, right? Yes, that's exactly it. Sorry. Uh, sorry, you got excited to skip the word. Well. Anyway, uh, so... Great, we like it on first handling, but uh, how does it really behave once you pull that trigger? We've seen time and time again, we have what looks like a darling of a carbine, but we have these full-size cartridges, and they pack a wallop and a lot of recoil when you shrink a gun down, especially as small and as light as that one is, because that is severe. What did you see when it went bang? All right, so as far as... Yes, it, the 6.5 Japanese is a full power ca cartridge. However, I want to point out it's it's pretty dang close to intermediate. So you're putting that in this short carbine. It's like it was made for it. I mean, yes, there was a little bit more recoil, but honestly, I didn't find it that big of a problem. I felt it was almost like the perfect amount of recoil you would want to expect from a carbine. You can watch the video of me sh or the section of me shooting it again, guys, if you need to. There was barely any travel with that. But as far as recoil management on this gun, I felt comfortable. I realigned my shots quickly. I, I thought it was pretty precise with this gun, too, as far as accuracy goes. So y'all tell me that I thought this was great. All right, we're getting flying colors. So I do need to ask, were there any actual problems with this carving? Okay, so there is one small problem. And I mentioned that in the Type 38 rifle episode. Again, go watch that. If you haven't done that, I'll know. No, I won't. But it's the cock on close I mentioned before. It just, you gotta give it a little more oomph to push it forward and down. Like when it's on your shoulder, it is a little bit annoying. Like it, you can see it just causes more travel in the top of the barrel. So it's, I don't know, it, it wasn't my favorite, but honestly, that is such a minor thing. And that's just like I said, an issue with the Type 38 and the Type 44 carving we wanna talk about. It's just something that comes with the Arisakas. Well, I think we can guess the answer, but I still have to ask the question, would you take this one to the front? Hmm. Am I going to take this into battle? Let me think on that one. No hard guess there, guys. Yes, I'm going to take this one into battle. This had all the positives of the Type 38 rifle, and even better, shorter version. It's super compact and light. I can carry this on the battlefield with me all day long. Honestly, I feel like this may have taken the number two spot on my list. Um, so I do believe we do have one more to talk about, though, before we conclude this episode. You'd be right. Uh, here, let me borrow that back. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've got to make room for all this stuff. Let's see. We haven't done two at once. Uh, okay, this, again, is our Type 44. So let me hand that over to you. Thank you. And I guess, uh, is there any noticeable difference in the ergonomics between that and this? Any changes? Because we've already talked about a lot. Any changes? Well, um, let me think about for that for a second. I'm gonna go with, yeah, this just looks, sorry, this just looks meaner. I mean, there's really not that much of a difference. Weighs a little bit more with the bayonet attachment, but... Ooh, this just, like, it spells trouble on the battlefield. Honestly? I think this one has become my number one. Wow, okay, we're pushing for number one with a very odd choice, considering you don't ride a horse. Um, were there any actual problems with this particular carbine over and above the 38 carbine? Honestly, 
no, I really didn't have any problems with this gun. I mean, yes, it is a little bit heavier at the front because of that bayonet, but I honestly didn't find that a big problem. I felt it was actually an advantage for me because it did cause it to muzzle down slightly, which I felt helped with recoil management. So for me, it was a plus. And honestly, another plus is I've got fine ra five rounds and endless pokes with this. Huh? So in my opinion, Better than the Type 38, better than the Type 38 carbine, this is number one. Do I need to ask you the next question then? I feel like you got a little ahead of it, which is, would you take it into, does it matter now? Sorry, I guess I did skip ahead more than once in this episode. Yes, I would take it into battle. There is no question about that. This has all the pluses of the Type 38 carbine, plus I've got my pokey stick, so I'm pretty happy. I feel like uh, in this instance, we're going to have to disagree because I do, as a matter of fact, prefer the Type 38 carbine standard um, because while you've got your wonderful pokey wedge, uh -huh. I get this. And believe me, the Type 30 bayonet is terrifying in and of itself. I get to use it as a utensil of sorts on my belt and it doesn't have to be there. Uh, bearing me down or adding weight unless I want it to be, at which point I can just sort of click over and I've got all the same reach, more adaptable, and I'm pretty happy with this in a trench configuration. So I still got my five and pokey. Yeah, but what if I take it from you? Uh, no, you get the pokey. You get my pokey. Anyway, uh, while we try to resolve this, you guys can stick around for the credits and catch up on the updates at the end of the episode. Thanks for joining us. Later, everyone. gang let's do some updates number one i want to make sure that i address the t-shirt production because some people have been asking just like to remind everybody that was a 30-day campaign in which we gathered up all the possible orders so that we could make a bulk purchase of the shirts so in other words not one shirt was purchased until after the 30 days and then igg did sit on the cash for a couple days after that. I think there's some sort of approval process, but the, the day the money was in my hand, the money went straight to buying the shirts. The raw material's already in, production is already done. All that's left is shipping, and I have been told that everything will be out by the 31st. So hopefully that keeps all of you up to date. I know some of you ordered in the first week and are thinking you should have it already, but it's a crowdsourcing thing, so Nothing got started until the end of the campaign. There's no way for me to start. Anyway, math. Uh, also, while we're talking, I need to say a big thank you yet again to Shoot Logic, who has been hosting us. Um, they've been hosting us for free for the entire time we've been doing this series. Uh, now that we have the funds, I have tried putting in a little more help to support that safety. range. Uh, for those of you that are local to South Carolina or the Southeast, I want to say very clearly that there is a charity shoot hosted by Shoot Logic that is benefiting the SPCA. That is going to be on November 12th. We are going to go. So if you want to meet up with us and you want to support the SPCA and you want to go shoot, come and join us. Uh, all the information is on Shoot Logic's website, and I'll get you more details as we get closer to that. And then lastly, uh, I want to make sure that I say this. All of you have been asking, is X-Gun going to be on the show? Here's the thing. If the gun is from World War I, it is in well, our a, uh, list. Uh, by the way, specific to that, if you have primary documentable source material on the use of the Krag Jorgensen in World War I, by all means email it to us. But if it's just so-and-so said so, or I saw it written in this book, but they didn't cite any source, don't bother, guys. I am actively looking for proof of crags in Europe, not in England, Europe. Um, if you have that proof, by all means forward it. I want to see it. I'm not saying that I don't believe it. I'm saying that I have no evidence. So first things first, crag is a hard no until I find some evidence. Uh, after that, though, if it's an actual World War One firearm and we have not done it, we are going to do it if... 
We can. That's the caveat. We have to get an example of it. So if you have one and you want to send it to us, <sighs> great. So email us. I have blah, blah, blah. I saw you haven't done the episode. We will be very happy to borrow whatever it is. Uh, we do, however, have the Lee Enfield locked down in terms of what we need. I don't need one million Lee Enfield emails. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. We appreciate the support. The show's going strong. Our vehicle is getting upgraded. Uh, we are going to be driving it out west next year so that we can visit some more museums and uh, machine gun owners and things like that. Uh, everything is moving. Honestly, it's almost moving too fast. So uh, I'm going to try to stay on top of this wave. And yet again, I appreciate the support. All right, bye.